Hello everyone, I'm Alana Bartolini, the moderator of today's event. I would like to welcome everyone in Prague, Czech Republic, Linz, Austria, Vanta, Finland, Frascati, Italy, and to those following online to the in-flight call with European Space Agency astronaut Paolo Nespoli on board the International Space Station. This in-flight call is dedicated to education and the theme living in space. We will be talking with Paolo live from the Columbus module. As I mentioned, we have four European sites connected in today and preparing to talk with Paolo. At each of these sites, teachers and students have been participating in local events throughout the day, which have been organized by the National European Space Education Resource Offices, known for short as AZEROS. The AZERO program is ESA's umbrella project for supporting the primary and secondary school education community in Europe. Azeros are offices established in ESA member states, which operate in the country's language and support the teacher community in their daily delivery of the national school curricula. There are currently 12 Azero offices covering 14 countries around Europe. Azeros partner with the national education institutions, ministries of education, and space agencies to provide teacher training and professional development, classroom resources, information about space careers, and competitions and hands-on projects for students. Azero's main objective is to use space as a context to excite and inspire students to engage science and technology. At each of the local events in Czech Republic, Austria, Finland, and Italy, the teachers and students have had the opportunity to participate in activities and hear from expert speakers about the uniqueness and many challenges of living in space. In just a few minutes, teachers in each country will have the opportunity to ask questions about this theme to Paolo Nespoli. To kick off the event, we will begin by going around Europe with a round of introductions from each of our connected sites. We will begin with Czech Republic. Our friends in Prague, please go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Alana. Good afternoon to many teachers and students gathered in Austria, Finland, and Italy. Welcome to the Zenger Sanditorium on Czech Technical University in Prague. My name is Lukáš Holman and I'm the ESERO Czech Republic manager. <clears throat> and uh, we are here with uh, more than 250 students and 50 teachers across the Czech Republic. We already had an interesting afternoon when uh, the teachers and pupils heard uh, many, many lectures about how important it's space in our everyday lives. And I would like to thank you to all keynotes and all the ESERO working staff uh, present here, because without them, we will not be able to organize the event like it's uh, the in-flight call. Uh, ESERO Czech Republic uh, was founded uh, three years ago and we believe the teachers are the ones who, who are able to inspire the pupils uh, to make a career in science or in technology. And in 2017, uh, the ESERO delivered uh, the space education to more than 850 teachers from Czech Republic, from, from more than 200 schools. We saw Czech Republic is also organizing uh, many interesting competitions like, uh, like the CANSAT. And today we have the unique opportunity to host uh, this fabulous in-flight call event. Uh, and for that, I have to specially thank uh, to all the technicians here at Czech Technical University because without them it wouldn't be possible to organize it. I'm also very pleased uh, that uh, the Slavomir Zdipsky, the ESA education representative, is here and uh, he has given an exciting presentation about life in space and the space in future, how we will explore what we will do in space. And also many experts uh, from the Czech uh, universities and uh, the Czech Academy of Science uh, give us very exciting uh, presentation about uh, their research. And now let's switch to our colleague in Austria. Yeah, thank you and hello from Austria. Servus from Linz. 
Uh, it's a great pleasure to meet you here in Czech Republic, in Italy, in Finland, and of course a very special hello to Alana in Aztec. My name is Andreas Bauer and I'm the head of the Aus Electronica Center, but I'm also the head of ISERO Austria Supervisor, and uh, I'd like to welcome you all of here in the Skyloft of the Aus Electronica Center for this very special moment, this moment that we've all been looking uh, had for a very long time a talk, a live talk with Paolo Nespoli from the, at the International Space Station. Together with me here are more than 100 students from, yeah, let me say a very special welcome and thank you to the pupils from the BRG Europa Gymnasium because they were the ones who were in charge of the Austrian questions and uh, together with them they really worked hard to make these things happening. We also have schools from Vienna traveling up here just <coughs> part of this very amazing moment. Uh, Ars Electronica has always been a place where future and technology and innovations came together. You can always say we were the, on the hunt for new ideas and for the inspirational power that is behind new technologies. And uh, what impact particularly these new technologies have on our daily lives. Uh, so the DNA of Ars Electronica is a triangle between art, technology, and society. The center where we are here today particularly is focusing on to give as many people as possible an idea about what impact these new technologies will have on their and on our daily lives. And that's why the Ars Electronica Center is a very special match to the topic of space and space science because space is not only about science and technology, it's about creativity, it's about vision, and it's about dreams, but most important, it's about us. What does it mean for us as an explorer to go out in the universe? So we are very proud at the Ars Electronica that we can host the Zero Office now since more than a year. We also feature an exhibition called Spaceship Earth on the topic of Earth's observation. And we also work together with ESA on an artistic environment. We have several artists having a residency and spending time and talk with the scientists and with the technology experts at ESA in Aztec, in Frascate and all the other sites as well. And Today, this collaboration between Ars Electronica and ESA makes a fantastic step forward with having the possibility to talk live with Paolo Nespoli. Um, so I would like to welcome you all here in the, in the center and I would like as a last thank you, a very personal thank you goes to Andreas Leib. He is the zero manager of Austria and he really worked hard the last couple of weeks to make this happen to make this possibility uh, of talking with, with Paolo. What have we done before here? When the kids arrived, when the teachers arrived, we had several workshops. We had Astropies competition. We were building rockets. We were exploring the space uh, material kit and some other activities here in the Aus Electronica Center. And we've already been in space. We used the Deep Space 8K, our big presentation and projection room, to travel in 3D into the universe into the borders of our existence and of course we also visited the ISS in 3D in our deep space. So we're really looking forward to talk with Paolo now. That's it for the moment from Austria and we say goodbye at the moment. We're a big wave from Austria and pass on to Finland. Thank you. Thank you Austria and good evening from Vanta, Finland and Heureka, the Finnish Science Center. There are over 50 teachers and students in this auditorium with other Heureka visitors. And everybody, if you could turn around, look at the camera and give a big wave. My name is Jutta Kujasalo, and I'm the head of learning and events here at the Science Center. Beside me in the first row are also the teachers who will be asking the questions from Paolo Nesapoli later on today. We're all very excited and thrilled 
to be able to take part in this in-flight call. Heuraka was founded in 1989, and since the opening, the focus of our work has been in inspiring and motivating children, students, adults in the fields of science and technology. Heuraka is a cultural and educational institution where you can experience and learn about science and technology in an exciting and fun, hands-on environment. Our mission is the joy of discovery, where we inspire discovery, participation, and learning. Research and science are the core of our operation, and we aim on impact. Science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, the STEAM subjects, are the core of our work. The Science Center is a multiple learning environment where several laboratories, a planetarium, the Science on a Sphere exhibit, a science theater, and the exhibitions are only part of all the surroundings, learning environments, and the facilities we use with our visitors. Heureka is one of the collaborating partners of Nordic ESERO. Together we aim to support teachers in bringing STEM subjects which use space as a context to the classrooms in Finland. We organize workshops for teachers and develop resources to use in the classrooms. All this to enthusiast the students to choose for a career in the STEM fields in the future. Today, we have had a space afternoon with the Finnish teachers and the students that are here in the audience. During the afternoon, they have been orientating to the theme, living in space. To better understand the scientific work done on space flights, they have attended two hands-on workshops where they have built spectrometers and sundials from very cheap, easy-to-find materials. Also, the beauty of our planet and the vision of it from space has been emphasized by many astronauts who have attended space flights. To get a glimpse of the view the astronauts have experienced and how Earth appears from space, the teachers have seen a show today on the Science on the Sphere exhibit about the Aurora Borealis phenomena. Occasionally, this beautiful scenery of various colors of the northern lights can also be seen here in the southern parts of Finland. However, if you want to be sure to see the northern lights, it's better to travel to Lapland. To understand the differences, of Earth and space and the life there, Mr. Markus Hotakainen, who is also in the audience and a well-known journalist, has held an inspiring and fascinating keynote speech today. He is also in the audience and sends his greetings to his personal friend, Paolo Nespoli. And finally, before we came to this auditorium, the teachers have been in our planetarium and seen a film about dark matter, the topic that is under great research and of which we have still a lot to learn from. By inspiring and motivating visitors of all ages towards science and technology, we here at Heureka hope and aim to have an impact on the future workforce and thus get more researchers and answers to the still unsolved scientific questions. With these thoughts and welcoming words, let's now switch to our colleagues in Italy. Thank you, Finland. Good evening from Italy and from Isa Ezrin. I am Susanna Tolico, and here I am with teachers and students 
coming from various schools uh, from Italy who have joined us today for the in-flight call with Paolo Nespoli. We are all very happy and excited to be participating to this great event. ESRIN is ESA Center for Earth Observation. <coughs> it's located in Frascati, a small town 20 kilometers south of Rome in Italy. <coughs> with ESA's Earth Observation satellites, we are able to provide a truly global picture of our planet to, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, <coughs> to safeguard the fragile and unique spaceship. <coughs> in which we live and uh, which Paolo is observing every day when he looks down to us from the ISS. We are very happy today to have primary, secondary and high school teachers and students with us, many of which have already participated to ESRIN Open Day events, which is a full week of mini laboratories we do each year, giving to around 1,500 students hands-on experience with everything from asteroids and launchers to satellites and space travel. We therefore have in the room teachers and students who met Paolo during past open days when Paolo took the students on a guided tour through the International Space Station showing the experiments he took part in as well as the breathtaking pictures of planet Earth, which he took from the Italian made cupola. Paolo's mission name is Vita, which means life in Italian. It is a mission of ASI, the Italian Space Agency. And so today we had the pleasure of having two <coughs> guest speakers from ASI who worked very well, closely on the VITA mission. <coughs> <coughs> One is Giovanni Valentini. And then <coughs> Marino Crisciono, who is principal investigator. We also have lucky teachers here who are are ready to ask Paolo their questions and we are looking forward to seeing Paolo on the ISS. We still have approximately 10 minutes before the connection with the ISS is established. All sites, including ours, will go into a standby mode while we wait for the ESA moderator to start the in-flight call. Stay tuned.
So we wait 10 minutes uh, to have Paolo connected with us. 10 minutes. Hello to all of our sites and to those following online. Just so you're aware, we're making final connections and we'll be starting the in-flight call with Paolo Nespoli in approximately 10 minutes.
Hello again to everyone following online and at our sites. We are doing final checks with the ISS and we will be ready to start in approximately five minutes. To repeat, we're doing final checks and we'll be starting in approximately five minutes.
Houston Station, we are ready for the event. European Space Agency, this is Mission Control, Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is ESA moderator Alana Bartolini. How do you hear me? Station, this is ESA moderator Alana Bartolini. How do you hear me? Station, we hear you loud and clear. Hello, Paolo. Good afternoon. You're now connected with Czech Republic, Austria, Finland, and Italy. I'll hand over to you for some opening remarks, then we'll open the floor to questions. Yes, good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's a pleasure to have uh, all uh, those countries representing Europe here in space. Uh, welcome to the International Space Station. I know you have uh, had a very uh, intense program so far, talking about space, uh, doing uh, and understanding a lot of uh, the reasons why we go to space. And, uh, and now we're going to show you a little bit. So I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. We will begin with our first two questions from Czech Republic. Czech Republic, please go ahead. We will begin with our first two questions from this is Jan Mishka. I'm a member from uh, Czech Astronomical Society and I have following question to you. Uh, when the new generation of spaceships will be built, do you think they will include a centrifuge module that would mimic gravity to counteract the effects of the microgravity? Grazie per la risposta. Yes, good afternoon to you and to all the Czech Republic. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, that is a, it's an interesting question. Uh, we here on the International Space Station, we are orbiting Earth uh, in low orbit. And one of the reasons why we are here is because there is no gravity. We don't feel gravity. We have a small centrifuge that where we can put some uh, samples uh, or some uh, animals and spin them to compare uh, what happened to them uh, to other animals also other plants that are left in zero-g but normally uh, we, we, we think I believe that centrifuges here uh, are not useful for humans uh, or at least they are complex enough to make things on the space station uh, too complicated to have a centrifuge of course if we if we will fly uh, deeper away from earth uh, flying for many months if not years towards a planet probably having a centrifuge will make sense and will uh, warrant the complication that uh, the technical complication of having a centrifuge on board Hi, Paolo. My name is Viera Shimonova. I teach in secondary school in Peron. And uh, we have the question for you. How does the stay in space affect your psychological health? Are there any experiments that study this? Thank you. Right, and if I understand correctly, your question is about time in space. Is that correct? To repeat, the question is, how does the stay in space affect your psychological health? Are there experiments that study this? Okay, I'm sorry. Now I understand the psychological effect. Um, yes, I think leaving f anywhere, any any time human beings live in a confined, uh, remote, isolated environment, uh, any time human beings have uh, uh, psychological and health uh, problems, this is a well-known uh, effect. Here on the space station, we are in the ultimate, I would say, isolated and remote environment, and uh, and our psychology, our psychological behavior uh, changes. We do uh, carry out the 
experiments. This is a good, uh, it's a good point for experimentation. Uh, we are checked constantly to verify if our, how, how our brain works, what are the changes, the fact that we have to adapt to a new environment and, and when we go when we arrive here in space, we are essentially disabled uh, until we understand how things work. This is all part of the study and allow scientists to um, check our brain, study our brain and uh, derive conclusions that are useful to everybody. Uh, we do live together with uh, uh, five other crew members and there's also it's a forced uh, environment and that also has uh, some uh, uh, psychological complication as uh, the fact that you are far away from your family uh, somehow you're missing them but they are also missing you and it happens uh, not long time ago that I was here in space and a hurricane arrived in Houston and hit uh, uh, Houston with my family my wife and two kids alone there of course we have a lot of support uh, the the agency provides support but it's still a stressful situation but this is part of learning and understanding how we behave and uh, uh, get to conclusion that will help everybody Thank you, Paolo. We're now heading to Austria for their two questions. Hello, my name is Hans Otto Gassner from Europa Gymnasium Aarhof. My question. Where does the oxygen on the International Space Station come from? Are there plants on board that help to produce breathable air? Hello, Hans in Austria. Welcome to the International Space Station. Uh, today here on the space station, uh, most of the oxygen that we breathe actually comes from Earth and is uh, supplied by vehicle that every uh, three to four weeks uh, arrive here on the space station. Uh, most of it is like that. Some uh, comes actually from uh, uh, an electrolysis process because here we recycle water. Not all the water can be recycled to the level where it can be it's potable again and the one that is not potable can be broken down and the oxygen can be uh, reused in that way. We do have uh, uh, plants, a little few plants here, uh, but mostly not for producing oxygen uh, uh, for uh, testing the capability of producing enough uh, uh, food, uh, fresh food for, for uh, a cruise that will go uh, farther away than low Earth orbit. And I guess it would also help with uh, uh, cleaning the CO2. So, hello, my name is Ruth Brown, and I'm a teacher at Europa Gymnasium Aarhof in Linz. And here's the next question. Um, many films depict humans living in space and on space stations. What are some of the biggest inaccuracies from a scientific perspective regarding how the human body behaves in microgravity? Yes, don't go to uh, watch a science fiction moving in space with an astronaut because, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to let you, pester you enough that you cannot enjoy the movie. Um, it's very, very difficult. Actually, it's almost impossible to, to simulate uh, zero gravity in, on Earth. And, and therefore, uh, when I see a movie that I film in space, uh, I see things that are actually different, that do not, uh, do not work like that in space. Also, you know, astronauts uh, in films are always uh, superheroes, super genius, super everything. But here in, in space, we are actually regular uh, worker that do a lot of things. And uh, most of the time, we actually uh, do what uh, mission control tell us to do. So we are, uh, we are the, 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 not really the hero, but the workers. And uh, that's also a very interesting thing. Thank you, Paolo. We'll now switch to Finland for their two questions. Hello, Paolo. Uh, I'm Jonas Prot from uh, Vienelska School. Huh? Every day on the ESS, you experience 16 sunrises and sunsets. During a long-term stay on the ESS, how is your ability to perceive time affected? And how do you try to maintain your biological rhythm?
Hello, Jonas. Hello, Finland. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on board on the space station. Uh, time, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, topic here on the space station. And in fact, without uh, reference to the outside, or even if you have a reference, uh, the, the cycle uh, sun uh, day and night changes so fast that your circadian rhythm, your body, does not have time to, to adapt and to sync up. Uh, so what uh, we actually do, we try to go by the watch. Uh, we have uh, we use GMT uh, and uh, we actually work according to the watch, which is really interesting and makes you think that time is really uh, a, not a, an objective thing. It's a subjective thing. So it could, you know, sometimes I think uh, 10 minutes is passed and and instead it's 45 minutes and sometimes uh, the time never passes. So it's it's really really interesting how time is really linked to our environment where we are. Pumel, and uh, my question is about clothes. And uh, I wonder if you use cotton clothes at the ISS, or do you prefer synthetic clothes that uh, don't leave as much dust? And if it gets dusty on the ISS, how do you clean it? That is a very interesting question. So, uh, we actually, most of our clothes uh, are actually made of cotton. Uh, yeah, the drawback is that they leave a little bit of dust or filaments that actually are circulated into the air and eventually they are absorbed by our life control and support system. So there is constantly on the space station, there is a recircle of air. There is a draft that will pull things uh, towards the fan and the fan has a grid and will capture all these little substances. And every week we go and vacuum and clean everything. Uh, we usually use cotton because because uh, it's one of the best things that uh, works against fire. Uh, most of the uh, synthetic um, uh, fabric uh, has a problem with the melting and, and therefore causes problem in case of fire. And we really need to be attentive here on station about fire. So we end up uh, using cotton. It's very breathable. It's a natural fiber. Uh, it's very nice to wear. Uh, we don't have a capability to wash it, so whenever we use uh, shirts or pants over and over and over and over, and then finally, eventually, when they are dirty, we just throw them away and use a new pair. Thank you, Paolo. We will now switch to Italy for their two questions. Hello, Paolo. My name is Elisa Piovesana from Instituto Comprensivo Corradini in Vermicino. My question is, when you spend a long time in space, uh, at what point do physical changes uh, such as muscle loss become noticeable and how do you deal with it? Buon pomeriggio Elisa Vermicino Frascati e Italia, salute. Yes, um, uh, changes, uh, body changes in space uh, uh, become fairly quickly. I still remember my first flight was a shuttle flight, a relatively short flight, 15 days but I really felt uh, different when I came back from Earth. And in fact, for a few hours, I even had difficulties walking, uh, standing, and, uh, and, and being a terrestrial person uh, again. So uh, physical changes set in pretty quickly once you are in space. Uh, once you, you learn that there is no more up and down, you learn that you can flip around and, uh, and, and establish your own vertical and have no problem. Uh, this then uh, becomes a problem when you go back uh, to Earth. Uh, we do uh, about two hours of physical fitness per day, uh, one hour of cardiovascular exercise, like a cyclet or, uh, or a treadmill, and uh, we do actually weight training for another hour. This, uh, this in order to maintain our uh, skeleton and our muscle uh, uh, mass, otherwise we lose uh, mass pretty fast. fast. Hi Paolo, my name is Rosa Maria from the secondary school Leone XIII Carpinetto Romano from Rome. Nice to meet you again. 
the question. In the future, what are some of the main challenges humans will face uh, if we want uh, to leave uh, another planet? Well, there are a lot of uh, challenges if we want to, uh, if we want to to fly to another planet, go to another planet, and eventually establish uh, a community up there. Um, uh, I guess that there are a lot of the similar challenges that uh, the first pioneer had when they left their family, jumped on ships and crossed an ocean. They really didn't know where they were going, and most of them did not come back, actually. Um, and our travel in space is going to be very complicated. The distances are very far, and just going to Mars probably takes uh, at least one year of travel going back and forth, if not more. And, uh, and therefore, there are a lot of challenges in terms of, uh, of, of a group of people being able to uh, live, work, stay in a relatively confined environment and then go to a planet that may have uh, may be hostile. There is a lot that we need to learn uh, before we can do that, but I am uh, I am positive that every time we human discover that we have a problem, eventually somebody finds a solution. So I'm really looking forward for our, um, in the future, to travel to another planet and even uh, uh, establish a permanent uh, life, a permanent human uh, life up there. Thank you, Paolo. We will now head to Czech Republic for one question. Hi, nice to meet you and see you. It's a great opportunity for us here in Czech Republic. Uh, my name is Matej Bija and I'm from high school, uh, Gevo from Prague. And our question or our student is about the um, uh, inflatable module. We have question. We have recently seen an inflatable module attached to the ISS. Are there any differences between living and working in an inflatable habitat compared to the traditional ISS modules? Thank you for your time for us. Yes, well, inflatable modules are very interesting structures. Uh, in principle, they can be much lighter at much smaller in volume when they are launched uh, in space. And then when they are in space, they can inflate and, and become pretty big. So they are really, really interesting uh, from that point of view. Uh, on top of that, they can be made of a substance that uh, if uh, hit by, a, let's say, a meteorite or micrometeorite can actually repair itself. Uh, so it's uh, they are very very interesting, and I'm I'm guessing that in the future uh, we will have uh, we will use that this kind of structure um, to build a bigger space station. Um, now they, they the fact that they are inflatable uh, uh, forces a little bit the shape, uh, which usually is a, a circumference or an elliptic uh, shape. Uh, but uh, but I think. Uh, I think it, the the, the uh, advantages uh, overwhelm the disadvantages. We do have a small inflatable uh, module up here on the station. It's actually a test module. Uh, we went uh, normally it's closed because they are testing to verify that there is no leak and uh, it can actually be in space without uh, causing any problem. Uh, we went in there a week ago just to test, and I have to say that from the inside it looks exactly like any other module, and I would not have, would not have any problem leaving it there. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, that's about all the time that we have. So I'm now going to hand over to you to give a brief goodbye to Czech Republic, Austria, Finland, and Italy, and to those following online. It was uh, really a pleasure to have you this afternoon here on the space station. Has uh, I hope it was a pleasure for you being guest of uh, uh, the institution there. Learn about space, uh, open up your horizon. Uh, we do challenge you to dream, to come up with uh, impossible dreams, uh, like for example going to space. But any dream that you that you can have, any dream that comes from your passions, we do challenge you to come up with things that are impossible and then uh, wake up and start working because uh, uh, this impossible thing when people really want 
when they apply themselves, when they learn from mistakes, when they work on team, when they, they uh, study and, and understand what they're doing, even this impossible dream come true. So I'm looking forward to coming back to Earth uh, in about a week, but uh, uh, keep uh, expanding, uh, keep talking to uh, school, uh, school kids and, and uh, push them to go further. And I'm looking forward to be back uh, maybe in 20 years and, and be sitting there where you are now and watching some of you in space or, or God knows where doing crazy impossible things and enjoy that. Uh, so uh, enjoy and have a good time. Ciao. Okay. Everybody. This is Alana back at ESA Aztec. Uh, to those of you that didn't get a chance to ask your questions today, I encourage you to uh, perhaps pose them to Paulo online. He's really great with answering things on Facebook, Twitter, uh, on his blog. So uh, I encourage you to ask the questions on there. I'd like to take a moment to thank everybody at all of our sites today, uh, and also to those that are here with me in the master control room, Christina, Case, Andrea, and Stefano. Thanks to all of them for their hard work. Uh, also to my ESA colleagues that are on site. And now we're going to quickly go around for a round of goodbyes from each of our sites, starting with Czech Republic. Um, I would like to thank you first to Paolo for, for his time and uh, for all of his answers to, to questions, not uh, only from the Czech teachers. I would like also thank you to ESA to provide us uh, this unique opportunity to do the in-flight call here in the Czech Republic. I would like to thank you, the Czech Technical University and all of the partners of, of the event. And of course, I would like to thank you, all of you here, graduate, uh, for to be present here. And now just only wave to all of the sides and move to Austria. Thank you. Thank you to all of us. I think in the name of all who are here today at the Oz Electronica Center, thank you for this great opportunity to talk live with Paolo Nespoli and uh, his great answers. I think he really got big inspiration for some of us here and we were talking before of who is going to be the next Austrian astronaut and I think their chances are fairly high that some, maybe one of them is in this room right now. Thanks a lot and a big wave from Austria Linz to the rest of Europe and international. Bye bye. Thank you also from Finland, Heureka and Vanta. We're all waving to you. I'd like to, I'd like to thank ESA for making this possible, Nordic SRO for wonderful collaboration, making this possible, and all you teachers, students, and Heureka visitors that have attended. Thank you also behind the camera, and now to Italy. Thank you, Finland, and uh, we would like to thank Paolo, we would like to thank all of you participating to this fantastic event, and we wish uh, to, to Paolo a fantastic, nice landing on the 14th of December. You can follow on ESA TV. Bye. Thank you again to everybody at each of our sites and to those following online. Uh, that's goodbye from here in the control room at ESA Aztec.